Hearts in Tennessee. Hungry Hearts Ministries is a non-denominational, Torah-observant, spirit-filled uh, group of believers. We use uh, Hebrew worship tools like the menorah, the tallit, the shofar, and uh, we believe that Yeshua died for our sins, and therefore we honor that sacrifice by keeping his laws and commandments. We are filled with God's Spirit, and we you know, worship him with it and practice the gifts. Today we're going to talk about uh, Yeshua Messiah as our prospective groom. The title of today's message is Uncover His Feet. Now we, here we are in the last of the last days. And uh, people always ask me, how do you know that? Well, one, you can just pick up a newspaper. Uh, two, you could just turn on Fox News and read the tape, because sometimes the stories aren't giving you the whole story. But, you know, when you, when you read the stuff that goes across the tape, it ought to make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, because it's bad stuff. It's bad stuff. Uh, all the prophets of old wanted to see how this worked out. They wanted to see our day. They got little pieces. Every one of them got a little piece. But they didn't get the whole puzzle. And they didn't usually have the book that you have in your hand to even be able to read all the pieces to the puzzle. And they all, it says in the book of Hebrews, that they all wanted to see our day and how this worked out in the end. And here we are carrying God's work. We're carrying God's work. How can I say that? Be because as we go through this study, you're going to see that to carry God's work, you've got to live by His commandments, and you've got to be filled with His Spirit, and there's just not many people doing that. That's a very, very small, small group. So we should feel very privileged to be a part of this group, and we should also feel very humbled that we were chosen to be a part of this group in this end time. Because not a lot of people are willing to do the things that we're willing to do. Not a lot of people are willing to go the places that we're willing to go to. And they say, well, Pastor Bill, you shouldn't say that. Well, they said it a couple years ago. We said this, Hungry Heart's the best feast you'll ever go to. And someone wrote me back and said, that's, that's, you shouldn't say that. that that's, that's, not, that's not nice. And I wrote back and I said, well, I didn't say it to be ugly, but I'm just telling you to be factual. It'll be the best feast you ever go to if you know how to keep the feast. Likewise, if you don't come to Hungry Heart's Pentecost, you, you really ain't never been to a Pentecost because there's supposed to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost and not just sitting in church. So to combine these things in a way that makes sense and is done decently in order, there's just not a lot of folks that do it. I'm going to start in Luke chapter 1. You know, on that first day of unleavened bread, Yeshua Messiah poured his power into our lives. And he did that as we took the unleavened bread. He is the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, and he poured that power into our lives. So he has empowered us to do this work for him. Amen? He has empowered us to do this work for him. So for those of you on, on YouTube, on TV land, I want to offer you our free magazine, Pursuit. If you'll email me at hungryheartsmin at aol.com, I will mail you this. I do You need your mailing address, though. Some people email me for the magazine and neglect to give me the address. But I need your address, and then I'll send you this free. The only thing I use your address is to send you this magazine, and if I'm going to be in your area, I'll invite you to the meeting. That's the only thing I use your, your address for. Luke chapter 1 and verse 6, we're talking about the parents of John the Baptist. Now, in the end times, the end time work is supposed to be the work of Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet. Jesus, in another place, I'm not going to spend the time to go there, said that, if you will, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. I just want to remind everybody that Elijah was not a nice person. We, we are all about some nice right now in, in the American church in the United States. It's all about some nice. It's all about the right countenance. It's all about telling you what you want to hear and making you feel good. Those people are dangerous. Run away from them. It's just like the movie Men in Black. The little blonde-haired girl with the Algebra 4 book. Shoot her. <laughs> the people that are nicing you up are the ones that you have to worry about. The ones who are rebuking you, frankly, from the Word of God are your best friend because they're trying to warn you of danger and problems and they're trying to help you to prepare to receive one of the greatest blessings God has ever bestowed on mankind, which is about to happen in our lifetime. And they say, well, you know, they've been saying that forever. Well, that's one of the signs. Saying that they've been saying it forever is one of the signs it's imminent. I don't know about you, but I, I watch Fox News, and I don't see how this goes on a lot further. You have Democrat candidates for president apologizing for being male. I only 
Really? I only saw the tail end of the segment. And, and, the, and the little, uh, the, he calls her the liberal, the liberal Sherpa to guide them through the liberal lollipop land, was, was nodding in agreement that he should apologize for his maleness. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, you better hope the U.S. Marines have more toxic masculinity than all the other people's toxic masculinity. Because if it's not, we're in trouble. They want to get rid of maleness. You can't make this stuff up, guys. I mean, you just can't. But down here in Luke 6, we're talking about John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. In verse 6, it says, Both of them were upright in the sight of God. Okay, any questions here? It's pretty clear cut, right? They're upright in the sight of God. You want to be upright in the sight of God, you want to be like these two people. Now look at what's upright in the sight of God. Observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Only other person I've seen that used in the Bible was Noah. Noah was blameless in his generations. That's not a genetic thing, by the way. That's that all of those generations alive in Noah's time, he was blameless and they were all corrupt. Oh, come on, that's, that's important. So these people are going to birth the movement of Elijah in their day, and this is what the eternal God required of them, that they live by all the commandments blamelessly. If we're going to birth the end-time movement of Elijah the prophet to prepare the way of the Lord, we got to live by these commandments and regulations blamelessly. I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you what's in it. I know a lot of folks get mad at me for that. But look, it's, it's right here in verse 6. This is important stuff. This is in the New Testament, by the way. We're in the New Testament, by the way. So don't tell me it's done away with, because here it is in the New Testament. We live in the days of Laodicea. With all the people lukewarm. God's eternal standard has not changed and will never change and it's not going to change and it's always going to be the same. We have to come up to that standard or we're going to be left behind. You know, the churches in America no longer teach the rescue of the saints. And the reason they don't do it is because they're missing the number one requirement. If you don't come up to God's commandments and regulations blamelessly, you're not going to get rescued by Jesus anywhere for any reason. You're going to stay here. So they're not teaching it because they're not living up to it. Even a lot of people in the Sabbath churches of God no longer teach it because they're no longer living up to it. Talked to a guy this week. Got saved, been in church. I was all happy for him. But it's okay that he and his girlfriend are together. Well, it's not in God's sight, but it is in that pastor's sight. So how happy is he going to be on the day? All of these pastors, all of yeah, Miss Lenise, he's going to slap the pastor, and this guy probably will. Of all the people, of all the people on this earth who have nicey nice pastors that tell them what they want to hear and make them feel good and tell them it's okay and you don't have to clean this up, what's going to happen to them on that day? Or worse, what's going to happen to them when the tribulation starts and their members are completely disillusioned? You told me what? Well, how about us? You know that crazy couple lives down there on Coachland, never home on Saturday. They gone. They gone. Ain't nobody seen them in months. Like nobody knows where they are. People been knocking at the door. They cut the utilities off. Ain't nobody there. We don't know what happened to them. At least I go to their church. Put your circumstance in that same situation, right? Because once we're gone, dogs howling in the back. Nobody coming. Nobody coming to feed the dogs. Where is she? She ain't been here in months. I know she cleans, but she ain't been here in months. She don't come by to check on me no more. I wish I'd go with her to church when she asked. Be too late then, won't it? Be too late then, won't it? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be too late. You know it'd be too late. Some of us are going to use God's Spirit to come up to that standard, and we're going to the rescue. And some are not going to come up to that standard. They're probably not even going to stay. You know, I, I talk about this all the time, and it happens all the time, amen? It's not like I talk about it and it never happens. I talk about it and it happens regularly. People don't want to come up to the standard, and then they can't stay. Sometimes they tell me that God told them to leave. Then, I, then I'm really sad. I mean, I'm really, I mean, I'm not happy. At that point, I'm not going, oh, man. I mean, I have had a couple that I was happy, but um, that's a joke. That's a joke. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's not you. It was the other one. 
But I get really sad when they tell me that God told them to leave because now I know they had something going on. Right? And I feel bad. They, they, they had, yeah, I really do believe it. But for some of these, because they had something going on and the Lord said, you've got to get out of there. They're like, oh, this is the Lord. And I'm thinking, oh, that's bad. That's not good. That's not good. I've been pleading with you to come up to this standard and to live this great way of life and enjoy all the benefits and the blessings of living this way of life for so long, man. Why didn't you move? It's almost like Jackson traffic. You know, we were talking about prayer last night in, in court, you know, and I said, you know, some of y'all don't know how to pray. I said, just drive in Jackson traffic. You'll learn. <laughs> You'll learn to pray. <laughs> You'll learn to pray real fast. <laughs> Look, I was coming up, coming in today, and I, I was down by where the, the Walmart and the Kroger used to be down there in Bemis, the north end of Bemis, and this dude comes flying out, and I'm, I'm in the left lane. The guy in the right lane stops, and he decides he's going all the way across. He's not just going to pull out, so he just wanks out in front of me. i got to go in the turn lane to avoid him, and then he gets in the turn lane and makes a turn and cuts off all those people in the oncoming lane. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's nuts out there, man. Yeah, you learn to pray in Jackson. Hey, your prayer may only be Jesus, but you're going to learn it. You're going to learn it real fast because people do crazy stuff on the road here. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3. We've got to come up to this, this holy righteous standard. It really is that important. <clears throat> and it really does matter. People say to me, oh, do I really have to keep the commandments? Yes, you really have to keep the commandments. He's not, he's not going to make an exception for you. I'm sorry, he's not going to do it. He's made everybody else live them. He's going to make you live them. But look, Mr. Lee said I've been this, what, 30, 33 years, almost 34 years now? It's been fabulous. It hasn't been bad. We've had tests and trials through the way. But no matter how bad and ugly they are at the moment of pain, you always get delivered out of them in the end. Yeah, I know it hurts while you're in there. I mean, it's still fun to lose a job and lose your house and go through bankruptcy and foreclosure. But you get delivered in the end. It's okay. And we're going to talk about how to use that pain on Pentecost. So it's all right. You ever realize that? You've got to have pain on Pentecost. Did you, did you realize that? Did you realize that when you show up, you've got to have some pain? See, people don't realize that. There are certain feasts you've got you to have some pain. Pentecost is one of them. You've got to have some pain. That deep well of pain, we're going to get into that when we get over there. That deep well of pain. So just, we're not going to make the pain list like we did a couple of years ago, but you've got to have, be able to call that up. And, you know, frankly, you've got some, right? You've got some right now in your life, right? And, and it, isn't it a pretty good story, a nice jar? Full of pain, right? <clears throat> Revelation 3, verse 15. I know your works. Talking about works last night. I know your works. That you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. It's not a good place to be. Your works don't measure up. You're not keeping, you're not keeping God's laws and commandments. You're not blameless. He's going to vomit you out. It's not a good thing. This is bad. This is ugly. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. That's not a nice thing. He's not talking nice. He's not talking smooth things. He's not telling you what you want to hear. He's not patting you on the back and saying it's going to be all right. He's saying, you've got a real issue, and you've got to get over it, and you've got to do it quick. Now, the next verses are even uglier because it says, you've got to buy gold from me refined in the fire. You've got to go through the tribulation to get yourself back. We don't want to be there. No, we don't want to be there. That's not what we want to be. Not what we want to be. In or out, it's your decision. In or out, it's your decision. Now, over in Revelation 17, we're just going to read one verse. You ain't got to turn there if you don't want to. I'll just read it for you. Revelation 17, verse 14. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He's Lord of lords and kings of kings. With Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. Okay, God the Father called you. Yeshua Messiah chose you. You decide faithful. You decide faithful. Your neighbor doesn't decide faithful. The person sitting next to you in church doesn't decide faithful. Your boss doesn't decide. You decide whether you're going to be faithful. God the Father called you. Jesus chose you. Or you wouldn't be in here. Or you wouldn't be watching me on YouTube. You already have those two things. You decide faithful. It's a decision of the will. That's where people don't understand. It's the decision of the will. John 21. Verse 14, agape love is the love of the determined decision of your will. People want to make agape love all kind of things. It's not, but it is the determined decision of your will. I'm going to keep God's commandments because he saved me from death in the lake of fire. I'm going to keep God's commandments because I love him with all of my heart. I'm going to keep God's commandments because he touches me in the worship and I just, I'm addicted. i got to have more. 
I'm addicted. i got to have more. I'm going to keep his commandments because he, he comes to me when I'm under the tallit and he tells me things I can't know from the Bible and he shows me where to look them up. Oh, come on. That is just, I mean, it don't get no better than that. It's just as good as it gets. So, yes, I love him. I love him. I love him. Determined decision of my will. I'm going to give up things in my life that I want so I can have the things he... So for those of you on YouTube, I'm going to offer you this book today for a real small price. It's the key to God's heart. It's going to tell you how to connect with Jesus the Christ, Yeshua Messiah, in a very personal and intimate way in the worship. And this book is only $12. That includes shipping and sales tax. Now, if you don't want to get it from us, you can email me at HungryHeartsMIN. You can go to our uh, marketplace at HungryHeartsChurch.com. You can also get this book on Barnes & Noble's. Barnes and Nobles, and it's a little less there because they don't have to pay. You got to pay your own shipping and sales tax, amen. So it's a little less at Barnes and Noble, but you can get it at any Barnes and Noble, or you can get it on Amazon.com. It's got a little different cover on it, but uh, you can get that book, and it, they get it right out to you. John 21. We should be very familiar with this passage. <clears throat> Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Then he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now he's hurt. But you didn't catch it because you read it in English. Do you agape me more than these? Well, you know I filiate you. Do you agape me? Well, you know I filiate you. Do you filiate me? See how that changes everything. Agape, the determined decision of the will to do the Lord's will and to execute what he's given you to do. Philia, you're my bud. Do you agape me more than these? Well, you know I philia you. Do you agape me? You know I philia you. Do you philia me? Hmm. So, have we made that agape decision? Have we made the determined decision of our will that we're going to give him our agape love? It's not sloppy agape like you hear people talk about. It. Oh, the self-sacrificial. Okay, there, there's an element of sacrifice in it because Jesus asked you to do things and it's a sacrifice for you to do them. It's not that you're going to be self-sacrificial for some other human being. They didn't save you. They can't save you. They can't save themselves. It's nice to do nice things for other people, but doing nice things for other people does not supplant your absolute have to do it for Yeshua. So what's the first commandment? No other gods before him, right? So what we do is we put everything in front of God, and then, like, well, God, I couldn't get to your stuff. How's that going to work out for you? I can tell you right now, it's not. You do God's stuff, and when you get God's stuff done, if you can help somebody else, that's great. But he has to come first. It's a sacrifice. Yeah, a lot of times it is a sacrifice. A lot of times it's a sacrifice. I give up my only days off in a month sometimes to do stuff. Like we're talking about going to Cookville, I mean Crossville. That's my only day off for next month. And I'm going to go there and do that Arab Shabbat. Which means I don't get a day off for the month. That's going to hurt. Some of y'all get two a week. I only get one a month. It's going to hurt. But you know, in John chapter 4, he said, I've got food to eat that you don't know about. Say about this on the way to Corinth. There's a special impartation of him when you do that kind of stuff for him. He gives. He gives. Now, when the Sabbath is over, it's kind of like Cinderella. You're riding home in a pumpkin. <laughs> but... <laughs> Some of y'all got that. But, but while you're serving him on Shabbat, the provision, is, the provision is long and strong. So do you agape Yeshua Messiah more than the things of your life that cause you to work on Shabbat, miss holy days, tell lies, steal things, desire people that don't belong to you? Oh, man, that's, that's preaching right there. Do you agape Yeshua in fact or merely in the fiction of your own mind? Have you decided with the power of the Holy Spirit to push all of the things out of your life that offend Yeshua? Just ask him. He'll tell you. He'll tell you on the way home. My Lord the King, what offends you in my life? Be ready. Pull over. Don't, don't do it while you're driving. Pull, go ahead and pull over. Get the pencil and paper out because you're going to have a little list right there. Gird up. Some of them things you ain't going to like hearing. 
But he'll tell you. He'll tell you quick, fast, in a hurry. He'll tell you real fast. Amen? A couple got a couple amens. Are you willing to use the power of praying in the Spirit to overcome the wiles of the devil? Because he's going to mess with you. He's going to mess with you. Now, I, look, I, I'm using that in, in a generic sense. It may be the devil. It may be one of his, you know, thousands of underlings. But you know the point. The point is that a person, in, a, a spirit being in opposition to God is going to mess with you. They're going to come to your house. They're going to talk jack in your brain. They're going to tell you this is nonsense. They're going to tell you I'm a cult leader. Look, I, I watched a whole series on A&E on cults. We don't meet any criteria to be a cult. Not one. So it's kind of rich when we get called a cult. Some of the people that call us cults are in churches that meet criteria for cult. Oh, how about that? All righty, let's go to Ruth chapter 1. We're going to compare and contrast Ruth and Exodus like we've been working on for, for, day, for weeks now, talking about the seven weeks journey from Egypt to Pentecost, from Passover to Mount Sinai. Amen? And we've been going over the things... Because the, the book of Ruth is parallel to the book of Exodus. It's parallel. They do the same things. It's the same message in the same story. And so you've got seven weeks from Passover to Pentecost. And in Exodus 20, they have the God encounter of a lifetime. In the book of Ruth, in four chapters, she marries her kinsman redeemer, who was the type in the picture of Yeshua Messiah. Oh, come on. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Now, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16... Ruth makes a commitment. Ruth makes a commitment. Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and I. We made that commitment to Yeshua Messiah when we got baptized. Oh, did I? If I baptized you, you know you did, because I told you that before I put you in the water. If I baptize you, you know, you know, because I told you before I put you in the water. Now I'm hoping everybody else had that same that same talking to, not talking down to, but explaining to you the consequences of going in the water. In fact, that one guy didn't want to go in. Came up, pulled up to the hotel where we were going to baptize him. He came out and said, I, "You can't baptize me." I said, "I'm doing it. You're, go, you're going in the water today." He goes, "No, no, I can't go. You told me what the consequences are, and I can't do it." I said, "Well, I told you, and you're doing it, and you're going to own them." Matter of fact, he came, he didn't bring his bathing suit. I said, well, that's a shame because you're going to mess up some nice street clothes. So, yeah, I put him in. I put him in. Put him in his dress clothes. I sure did. He told me, I hate you, Pastor Bill. I get, I get that a lot. But I, I know what they mean is that they really are saying, I love you. I hate you because you're making me do something i got to do. But I really do love you because only you would make me do it. And I would only be willing to go through this for you. So, you know, I hate you. <laughs> but I put him in. And one day he'll thank me. A lot. But that's the whole point about being a good shepherd. Sometimes you got to do for people things they don't want because it's something they got to have. Amen? Yeah. Aren't you glad you got somebody who'll take the heat from you to give you something you got to have when you don't want it just because he knows you got to have it and I have that agape? See, here's the thing about it. When you're a winner and you have the victory, you are determined. He saw it through. He's determined. When you lose, you're just stubborn. Same characteristic. It's unwilling to bend when you've got to do it. The winners are determined. The losers are stubborn. So pick the one you want for me. I have the determined decision of the will to love you enough to see you through even when you don't want to go. Some of y'all aren't smiling. <laughs> it's like, oh man, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, Ruth made a commitment. We told the Lord we'd do it. And the reason Laodicea gets vomited out is because they refuse to live up to their commitment. James chapter 1, verse 22. <clears throat> James 1 and verse 22. I love you enough to see it through. <clears throat> Either that or I'm just stupid enough not to give up. Depends on whether we win, right? We're going to win. We're going to win. On that day, you'll be happy. When we get to that day, y'all going to love me, man. Y'all going to be your second favorite person. 
<clears throat> James 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Ha, ah, that was a nice word. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and forgets. It has no effect on him. I looked into the word. Word told me to keep Shabbat. I went out and played ball anyway. Could care less. Could care less. Sabbath's an easy example, right? You ain't going to pick any one of the commandments. People break them all. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. You make the commitment, the determined decision of the will to keep the commandments. There's a blessing just from mere obedience. Without God involved, there's already an automatic law set up that if you keep Shabbat, there's a blessing. If you keep marital fidelity, there's a blessing. If you don't steal, there's a blessing. If you don't lie, there's a blessing. If you do what you're supposed to, there's a blessing. Straight up. But then you've got a God who's active and involved. He's not a deist watching you from somewhere else. Oh, let's see. Oh, look down there, son. This is not going well for him. Oh, how about that? That's just too bad. That's not what's going on. But, Pastor, the world's crazy. I know the world is crazy. It's because we all have free will to be crazy, and we're crazy. It's not God's fault. Quit blaming God because we're all nuts. Had a shooting yesterday in Virginia Beach. You see it? The guy was nuts. It's not God's fault the guy was nuts. God's probably been trying to talk. Did you, did you read the story of Cain? I mean, God tried to talk Cain out to kill Abel for who knows how long before he finally killed him. It wasn't God's fault. It's Cain's fault. It's not God's fault that guy shot those people in Virginia Beach. It's his fault. We're crazy. And we do crazy things in a crazy world. And so those of us turning to God are trying to make sense of it all. And the only way to make sense of it is to make sense of your life. You can't fix the crazies. You can barely fix your own. If you'll fix your life and start living by the Word, you'd be amazed how many things straighten out just for you. It's still going to be crazy all around you. You're still going to learn how to, how, to, how to drive like a race car driver in traffic because people are going to... Huh. Uh. Exodus 15. You see, it's not the people who hear the law, who will be declared righteous. It's the people who do the law who will be declared righteous. There's no getting around that. Well, what about grace? Well, see, here's the thing about grace. You got saved by grace, and now it's not a question of grace anymore. It's a question of what are you going to do with it. See, you got already got saved by grace. All right? Now you want to keep on sinning like you weren't saved by grace. After you get saved by grace, you got to straighten up. All right, Exodus 15. <clears throat> Verse 22. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out to the desert of Shur. And for three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. That's why it's called Marah. Marah means bitter. So the water's bitter. So the people grumbled. There's always a grumbling. Grumble, 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 grumble. Always a grumbling. Always a grumbling. And they came to Moses, what are we going to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. This is a picture of Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross makes your bitter sweet. And then he says, the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and he tested them, and he said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, he will not bring on you any of the diseases he brought on the Egyptians, for I am yod heh vav -Heh, who heals you. Who heals you. So when we get saved, we wander around in the desert, and it's a hot, dry place. Because right, this is right after Passover. They come out of Passover, they're in the desert, they need water. So when you, come, when you get saved, you come into a dry place, and you need water. You're thirsty. And then we start grumbling. Grumble, grumble, grumble. And, and you know what it plays out? Because I forget which, which area it was, but right after Passover, the grumbling started. And I thought, we're at Mara. It happens every year. It's just this. You say, set your watch. The week after Passover, there's grumbling. Grumble, grumble, grumble. It's more. It's right here in the book. And they just got out of Passover. Here's Miriam and all the praise, and they got delivered. And Pharaoh's army's gone. Next thing, grumble, grumble, grumble. It's every year. It's not any different. It's been this way for all 17, 18 years of this ministry. <laughs> right after Passover, grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs> Mara, you got to go to Mara, right? I wasn't quite as, uh, as funny about it as I was then, but anyway. So what happens is we start questioning the miracles God's done for us. These people just got out of Pharaoh's army drowning in the sea. They were good as dead. Pharaoh had them boxed into the sea. He could have butchered them all. God delivered them. Big miracle. They go through. Pharaoh drowns. And then grumble, grumble, grumble. I mean, right away. But see, that's what happens. 
the demonic forces come at you and they say, your miracle's no good. Well, you know that just happened. That wasn't a miracle. You know you really didn't get healed. You just got well. You know you really didn't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You just mumbling and grumbling and all kind of little, and all kind of gibberish. And that's not, they always come to tell you your miracle from God didn't happen. We talked about that on the way home last night. But after you've had enough experiences with him, you don't care what they say. I know my experience is real. And not only did I have one or two or three or four, I got a couple dozen of them. I know they're real. You can't tell me that my miracle wasn't a miracle because I was there. Tell that to somebody else. Let them tell you my miracle wasn't real because they weren't there. But I was there. I saw it. And I felt it. And I tasted it. And I experienced it. You can't take my miracle from me. I don't need to grumble because I know how I've been saved and delivered and miracle after miracle after miracle when I should have been dead already. Oh, come on, somebody. <clears throat> we need to replace grumbling with praying in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Look, everybody in here got some reason to grumble, right? We all have them. We can stack them like cordwood if we wanted to, right? The list of paper would be a scroll to roll out the door. We gotta use those to pray in tongues instead of grumbling. But just pray in tongues because you need the water. You're thirsty. The whole thing is you're just thirsty. You need water. Just pray in tongues. Pray in tongues over your problems. You're dehydrated. You just need water. The water of the spirit. Get the water of the spirit flowing, and it will start solving that problem. Amen. This is an important factor for later, by the way. Now back in Ruth, <coughs> chapter one. <clears throat> I'm going to take up the story in verse 20 because I'm just just cherry picking little parts out of the story. I hope you all know the story. I think we talked about it last time even. I think I read most of these verses last time. <clears throat> she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. I went away full. I've come back bitter. The Lord has filled me full of bitterness. The Lord didn't fill her full of bitterness. I don't know why she's blaming God. It's not always the way. It's God's fault. Well, God didn't tell you to move to Moab. You were already in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Yeah, you had a famine. Turn back to God, pray, and get you some water. You went to Moab. You went to Moab. How did you expect to come back full from Moab? You went from the land of, of plenty to the land of none. So what? They had a good year that year, and you had a bad year. That happens, amen? That's why you got to save a little money, because sometimes you're going to have a bad... Look, it's not if you're going to have a bad year. It's when. And how many? And how, come on, you going to have, I've got kids, they like spending money. you got to save it. You're going to have a bad year. Oh, no, Daddy. You're going to have a bad year. No, trust me, you're going to have a bad year. You're going to have a bad year. It's not what you can take when you're in a good year. It's what you can defend when you're unemployed. Nobody likes that advice. Nobody likes that advice. But that's real. That's real. Just, just wait till you have to go through that six months period. You'll see how real it gets. Oh, it gets real. It gets real. <clears throat> she went away better. When she came back better, the Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune on me. She's grumbling. Mara, it's time. It's a time of testing. Testing comes so that we have an opportunity to show ourselves faithful. How are you going to say you proved faithful on the Sabbath if you never had to lose a job over it? Oh, pastor, that's easy for you to say. It really is easy for me to say because I've lost four of them already. It's real easy for me to say. See, it's one thing when you've been to seminary and you've never held a steady job in your life and you've got really soft hands because you don't work and you can come up here because your job is never, never in jeopardy and you say, oh, you've got to be willing to give up your job on the Sabbath. Knowing full well I'm never going to have to, right? That's junk. I've lost four jobs over the Sabbath. I've gone through bankruptcy and foreclosure over the Sabbath. And you know what? I do it again because that proves me faithful. You can't buy that badge. You can't buy that badge. Where do you go to buy that badge? Joseph A. Bank don't sell those. You can't get them on Amazon either. Christianbooks.com don't have them. Where are you going to get that badge? Lifeway's closed, yeah. You're going you're gonna to have to lose your house over the Sabbath. That's how, that's how you get that badge. But who wants to lose their job and their house? I mean, nobody wants that. I, mean, I don't see anybody signing up for that any time. I mean, let's put a sign-up list on the back for those who want to lose their job over the Sabbath. Ain't nobody signing that. Man, y'all will walk around the table. Y'all won't even go back to the table. Y'all come across the front. Ain't nobody even going near the table with that list on there. And yet, that's a mark of honor. That's a privilege in the kingdom of God to be able to go, I lost jobs over keeping the Sabbath. Testing comes so you can prove yourself faithful. 
And you know what? I hate to say it this way, but th this is really true. And you think it out and you pray about this and it's going to bear out. It's going to bear out in the Holy Ghost for you. Oftentimes we have to go through those things because we don't know we can. We don't know what we can do until we go through. It is so much that we can do. We do not realize the superhuman Holy Ghost power we have until we have to go through really ugly hard times. And then we find out, you know what? I did it. Come on, you're supposed to feel good about that. You passed it. I mean, how many of you went to school and you got a 100 and you didn't feel good? Oh, man, I got a 100. Where's your grade, son? Uh, Dad, I, I got a 100, man. It's awful. Just, just d d d don't, don't, don't beat me too hard. No, no, nobody went in like that. You went in with your F like that. What'd you get? You hid, right? You, you snuck it up there on the, on the counter and you ran. <laughs> I'm not even going to stick around for him to see this. I don't want to be here for about 30 minutes. Let him cool off a little bit at least. <laughs> they only get three or four licks. I won't get the whole beating. I mean, come on, man. Nobody wants to put that F on there. We've all done that. Well, maybe you didn't, but the rest of us, I did that. I put a lot of Fs on the counter, let me tell you. <coughs> Exodus 16. Nobody likes that F. Verse 1, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses. Here we go again. Grumble, grumble, grumble. My goodness, Moses, I, you ain't never met a catastrophe you couldn't make worse. Oh, my goodness, you've turned every victory into defeat. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Just imagine hearing that every day. Woo! Man, I'd have been praying for him. Lord, take them. Please just take them. <laughs> yeah, that's suddenly it's it. That's it. That suddenly thing from the Lord. That's the one. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you brought us into this desert to starve this assembly to death. They're hungry. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this day, I'm going to test them. I'm going to test them and see whether they're going to follow my instructions. They're hard-headed. I know they're not going to do it, but I'm going to put them to the test anyway so they can fail. Well, it's not because he wanted them to fail, because he just knew they would fail. I'm going to put you to the test because I know you're just not going to do it. On the sixth day, you're to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So they go out, and they start gathering this manna. God fed them with bread from heaven to show them which day was the Sabbath. So days 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, they gather one day's portion. Day 6, they gather twice as much Sabbath. Stay up in the house. Don't go out your tent. Hang up in the house. Now, they were allowed to go down to the tent of meeting and have church on the seventh day. This is not told in this part of it. It's not the message, so I'm not going to go to that part. But then later, when they disobey God, he makes them stay in the house. So they used to get to go to church. Then later, they told them to stay in the house because they wouldn't obey. God pours out his spirit every week on the Sabbath day so you know which day it is. That's why I say when you go to church on Sunday, you're a day late and a dollar short because the Holy Ghost gets poured out on Sabbath. Not my choice. It's his choice. If his choice was Sunday, I'd be doing Sunday. If his choice was Tuesday, I'd be doing Tuesday. If his choice was Thursday, I'd be doing Thursday. But his choice is Sabbath, so I'm doing Sabbath. Because I want to be there when the outpouring comes. I want to be there for the fresh manna. I want to be there for the good stuff. I want to be there for the encounters and the, and the experience. So how do you embrace the Sabbath? Verse 27. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather manna, and there wasn't any. Well, how about that? I bet it was the people that tried to keep it on the first day. They thought, it breeds worms and stinks, so I'm, I don't believe Moses. I'm going out Saturday because I'm not keeping this on, on Friday because it didn't, it didn't work on Monday and Tuesday. So I'm not about to do this on Friday. Moses is talking stories to us, and you go out there and there ain't no bread. Fast day. But look, worse, a good fast day, you get to spend time with the Lord. This is a fast day when he's mad at you, right? <laughs> Tomorrow, so the Lord said, um, I'm in the wrong verse, 27. The Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments? He's not happy here. How long do you refuse to keep my commandments? He's upset. 
Bear in mind the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That's why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is. Don't go out of your tent on the Sabbath. So they got punished. That's, that's a go stand in the corner. It's not a rule for all time. That's a punishment for them then. Unless, of course, you need that punishment today now. But that was a punishment for them. You're supposed to go to church on Sabbath. They were supposed to come down and attend a meeting on Sabbath. That's why they weren't supposed to gather manna. You're supposed to be down here worshiping God on the Sabbath day, and instead they went out and gather in manna, and you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, so God's mad at them. And he punishes them, stay in your old tent. When y'all didn't get that, because it's hot in the desert. It's really hot in the tent in the desert. He going to cook them. Not only are they going to be hungry, they're going to be sweating all day because they're going to be stuck in that old tent. They want to get out under some shade where there's a breeze, but there ain't no breeze up in... Oh, y'all get that in a minute. So this is a bad punishment right here. He's not happy with them. God fed them with the bread to heaven to show them what day Sabbath was. Now, for those who will humble themselves to keep the Sabbath holy, there's no lack of Holy Spirit. So you didn't catch it. Go back here to verse, uh, I think it's 18. When they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. So the one that gathered a lot had none left, as it says in the King James, and the one that gathered little had no lack. So you will not have a lack of Holy Ghost if you keep Sabbath. You won't have a lack. He's pouring it out for you. So you come to church on Sabbath like you're supposed to, you keep the Sabbath the way he tells you, you're going to have no lack of his presence in the day. Ruth chapter 2. No lack. Very important. See, we're, we're, we're building this up as we go through. I hope you see this. <clears throat> I'm not going to read this whole passage because we just did it last week. Or two weeks ago, I mean. So Ruth wants to go glean in fields for people near of kin. She wants to go glean. This is what Ruth has to do. Ruth has to crawl on the ground and pick up one piece of barley at a time out of the dirt. That's a hard way to get your day's food. And Ruth is not only doing this for her, she came back to Judah with her mother-in-law, Naomi, who's too old to do it. So she's having to do the work of two people to glean enough by picking up single grains out of the dirt for two people. Now I want you to think about this manna. It says this manna covered the ground like hoarfrost, and it was like little thin flakes. So the children of Israel had to get out on their hands and knees all over the ground out in that desert and pick up one flake at a time. It's the same kind of thing. They've got to go out there and gather one flake about a quart a day per person. Right? He who gathered much had none left. He who gathered little had no lack. You had to gather grand, little flake at a time. Little flake at a time. If you do this, you're going to get a lot of dirt in it. Think about it. Do this, you're going to get a lot of dirt in there. It melts off at a certain time. So if you don't get out early, you're not going to get any because it's going to melt. It says it melted off in the heat of the day. So once it gets hot around 10 o'clock, you had a lunch. <laughs> Ruth, meanwhile, is all day in the heat. Right? All day in the heat. Because it gets hot that time of year. And you're out in the sunshine because you're in the fields. Ain't no shade up in there. One grain at a time. You do this, you get a lot of dirt. No one wants to eat dirt. You want the grains. You got to pick them up. And maybe, maybe a whole head falls off. Oh, oh, whole head. See, we don't think about how tedious this is and how long this is and how painstaking this is. This corresponds to your need to get into this word. This corresponds to your need to get into this word. That picking the grain, that gathering the manna, is you getting in this word every day. You need this more than you need food. You need this more than you need water. You need this almost as much as you need air. You need this. You have to glean out God's precious truth from this book. Sentence at a time. Now you're lucky. You're lucky. You're real lucky. You're real lucky because you've got great teachers up in here like me and Kelly Mack and Sandy and Miss Francis that have already gleaned for you. And so we come in and we dump a bag full of fresh grain for you because we've already gleaned enough for you and us. But you daily got to learn how to pick. You daily got to learn how to pick. First thing you got to do is read it through from Genesis to Maps because nothing we say is going to make sense to you until you've read the story because you don't know what we're talking about. 
And maybe the second time before some things come, maybe the third time before you're really starting to get some meat on the bones, maybe the fourth time before you get a little light bulb going off from time to time as you read, maybe the fifth time before you start getting a Holy Ghost unction when you read stuff. Right? And so then, after that, you can start doing some study. And you can take something already ready to go like this, and we have all the scriptures in here, and you can go look up some more and look up the ones around it and use, use the reference notes, right? right? Y'all have reference Bibles where you've got the center column in here with all the little reference notes, and you can start connecting other verses that, that pertain to this. Oh, come on, somebody. This is how you learn how to grow. This is how you learn how to grow. This is what you've got to do. You've got to learn how to glean. This is very, very important. <clears throat> We've got to become PhDs in the law of God. Oh, but pastor, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a Bible scholar. Don't hang, your, don't, hang your, uh, don't hang your eternity on that. What do you mean you don't want to be a scholar in the Bible? You're called in this time. You're not called. This isn't, this isn't the great white throne judgment. You're called now. Evidently, God thinks you can be one. Oh, that takes work. Well, yeah. To take work, Miss Sandy? Yeah. Take work, Miss Francis? Yeah. Yeah, it takes work. Yeah. You get on the Talit and get a revelation, you still got to go dig it all out. You got the revelation, you still got to you still gotta get your concordance and dig all that out. You got to think about the verses you already know. Where's that verse? Where's that verse? Oh, man, I can't put those words together. How about when you have it in two different versions in your head and you got to pick which one your concordance is, right? You, maybe you're getting into King James and you're looking in the NIV. Maybe you're getting in the NIV, you're looking into King James. I mean, that can get real confusing. Acts chapter 5. I want to show you something here. This is so important. I got this early on. <coughs> very early on. I think my first time through the Bible I got this. This really quickened to me. And it is, it is, <coughs> it is an amazing, amazing passage. Amazing passage. Acts 5 verse 33. When they heard this they were... I'm sorry, 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that our apostles be put out. They're, they're, they're wanting to kill the apostles. Then he addressed the men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do. Some time ago, Thuidus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. And he was killed, and all of his father's followers were dispensed. It came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activities of human origin, it will come to nothing. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men, and you will only find yourselves fighting against God. And I thought to myself, if a doctor of the law can see that without the Holy Spirit, I want to be a doctor of the law. I'm going to be a doctor of law. You know who this Gamaliel is? Gamaliel taught the Apostle Paul everything the Apostle Paul knows. Let me tell you something about Gamaliel. I was at the temple two years ago, and Joel stood up to give his message, and he quoted something from Gamaliel, who he said was the greatest rabbi of all time. So, down here in the modern era, 2019, Gamaliel is still the greatest rabbi of all time who taught the greatest apostle of all time everything that apostle knew. Until he got saved and Yeshua explained to him what the law really meant. So how can you tell me that Paul is doing away with the law? This man sat at Gamaliel's feet. You can't tell me that Paul was doing away with the law when he was the highest, second highest doctor of the law in all of Judaism. He's not doing away with the law. He's explaining to you the meaning of the law. And if you don't understand those first five books of the Bible, you are never going to understand anything the Apostle Paul has to say. So don't bother reading Paul until you read the first five books and you master them. Because everything he's telling you is doctorate level teaching on those first five books. <coughs> Amen. We've got to show ourselves approved. Uh, flip over real quick to 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. <coughs> I'm going to read it. I just want you to see it. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. You've got to show yourself approved in the word. You've got to show your master and mine, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, that you know how to handle this book. 
You got to do that. Oh, but pastor. No, no, pastor, me. Get in there. Get in there and get after it. Some of y'all got all day. You got all day, why aren't you? What else are you going to do? Watch TV? Play on the phone? Get in here. The rest of us have to work first. I was talking to Joe last week about retirement. And I said, oh, man, that sounds good. And then he and he and Lynn were, were, were messing with me and going, yeah, but there's one problem with that, Pastor Bell. I said, what's that? He goes, you have to get old first. <laughs> well, no, there's about five decisions I made. I could have already been retired. <laughs> it don't have to be that way. It just turns out it's that way most of the time. Because when those things come to us when we're young, we don't know what we're doing or what to do with them, and they just go bye-bye. Well, bye-bye. Oh, man, why did I let that go? Oh, man, oh, man, oh, no. Anyway, a proof. That's it, it couldn't listen to nobody, that's right. So Ruth was diligent in gleaning for her very survival and that of Naomi, and we got to realize that our rescue is dependent on our work in the Bible. That's why we must make the time to get it right. Exodus chapter 17. We must make the time to get it right in this book. You can't fudge this part. You can't fudge this part. Exodus 17, verse 1. They're going to the rocket at Rephidim. <clears throat> Verses uh, 1 through 7. I'm not going to read all this for the sake of time. Moses is told to strike the rock and water's going to come out of it. This represents the fact that Yeshua Messiah had to be struck for the baptism of the Holy Ghost to come. We've shown you this book from the Exodus case and from the film The Exodus Revealed. It's a giant rock. It's split in half. And from the base of it, you can see in the pattern of the rocks how there was a major river flowing out of the base of that rock. And this flowed the whole time the children of Israel were camped there, and they gave them abundant water for everything they had to do. All of them, their bathing, their washing, their animals, everybody drank freely from this big rock. It's showing you the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how that water will satisfy you. It's very important because, you see, Pentecost is not just the day of the law. It's also the day of the Spirit. So this, the law comes on this day. The Spirit comes on this day. We're going to develop this as we go just a little further. The last great day's outpouring has come with Sabbath people beginning to speak in tongues. When I first gave this message, that had not started yet. But it's begun. Sabbath people praying in tongues. More and more Sabbath people, even though they may not pray in tongues, are more accepting of it than any time in my lifetime. This is, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. It comes for the people who don't grumble. We don't want to grumble in the last days. Acts chapter 2. We should have had this a long time ago. We should have had this a long time ago. This outpouring should have been 20 years ago. That's a long time. That's a long time. Amen. It didn't come. It didn't come because we the people weren't ready. You know what it says in Hebrews? God didn't find fault with the law. He found fault with the people. It's always the people. We're going to be the people that get it. Right here at Hungry Hearts, we're going to be the people that get it and get it right and make it. We're going to be the ones that do it. We're going to do it. And not only do I believe in you, I believe in Yeshua who's given us the instructions step by step how to do it. Oh, come on somebody, that's good stuff. When he gives you step by step instructions, a little step at a time, a little step at a time, a little step at a time. You just got to take them one step at a time. Oh, that's easy. It's easy button, right? Get a, maybe we got to get a banner for that. Big red easy button. Jesus, it's just that easy. Peter here, starting in verse 15... In verse 17, he's quoting a prophecy from Joel. In the last days, God said, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. That Greek word for prophesy means an ecstatic utterance in the Holy Ghost. Over at the beginning of chapter 2, Praying in tongues means an ecstatic utterance in the Holy Ghost. Back in number 16 when he gave the manna and they all prophesied, or the 72 elders prophesied, the Hebrew word means the same thing, an ecstatic utterance in the Holy Ghost. So all of this is praying in tongues. They're going to prophesy. I'll show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood, fire, bills of smoke. That's not exactly how it goes. It's bloody moons and sackcloth suns. 
We watched a great film on the star of Bethlehem. He goes to this passage. Then he goes to the uh, U.S. naval charts and shows that there were bloody moons before the crucifixion and bloody moons after the crucifixion and a sackcloth sun during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so the whole thing was identified with bloody moons and sackcloth suns and bloody moons. Marking it to make sure nobody could miss it. And so Peter's saying, this just happened, guys. Peter, now who of us can say we've ever had the Holy Spirit to the place where we had a flame of fire on us? And he did, and he's giving this speech, and he's saying, this is the prophet Joel happening. And yet we know the prophet Joel is still going to happen again. But Peter's saying that the book of Acts, chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, was a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. Wow. And then in 1998, we had sackcloth suns and bloody moons on holy days, and we should have had the outpouring during the Hellbot Comet in 1998. But we didn't have it then. Because the worldwide broke up in 95, and we were all still grumbling about it. Some people are still grumbling about it, by the way. Some of the splits. Grumble, grumble, grumble. It's like a race car warming up, right? Grumble, 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 grumble. And that's not how we get where we're going. We've got to give it up. We've got to give it up. <clears throat> Instead of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we got quarreling and testing and the great falling away. We got Meribah and Massa, grumbling and quarreling and the great falling away. All of the ex-people from that group still won't meet in one room together. You know, Kelly Mack got four of them together uh, last week in Texas, by the way. Eighty-five people from four different groups, including the Seasons of Our Joy folks. He got an invitation from them to go speak. So he actually got 85 of them. I, I was just, I was, I'm glad, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy. I was still stunned though because I'm like, you got four of them to sit in the same room? Really? <laughs> How'd you do that? Did you drug their drinks? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> but we didn't get the outpouring we were supposed to have. We got the great falling away. Now you tell me, at the feast in 1994... Mama Eunice was there. She went with us one day that feast. We had 146,000 keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Not in that one place, but, but world, all, all around the world. That doesn't count the CGI people that year. They probably had a big year too. But in 1995, you had the great falling away. You couldn't pull 38,000 of them together right now on a bet. Think, do you think that's a great fall? I think it's a great falling away. I think it's a real great falling away. It's bad. It's not good. We had another round of bloody moons and sackcloth suns in 2014 and 2015. We had them Passover and Tabernacles, bloody moons in 2014. We had Passover and Tabernacles, bloody moons in 2015. And dead center on the first day of the sacred year, we had a sackcloth sun. So, so much for the calendar, people. I think God pretty well nailed that. Because it didn't match up on any of their calendars. It was just, oh, it's a sign, okay. But on the traditional calendar, bing, 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 bing. Now, how do you do the, you know, the bloody moons and the sackcloth suns and then the sackcloth right there on the first day of the sacred year? I mean, if that doesn't peg the calendar for this time and this season, I don't know what will. I don't know what will. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. <clears throat> Chapter 1. <clears throat> I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. There's got to be a great falling away. I think we've had it. I think we've had it. We've had two sets of bloody moons and sackcloth suns. We should have already had the outpouring, and it's only now just a trickle. Should we have this outpouring? Yeah, we should have this outpouring. It's not coming because it's not finding hearts ready to take it. That's, that's part of our mission is to have hearts ready to take it. Amen? That means we've got to summon the agape love to love Yeshua more than our sins. We've got to summon the agape love that we're going to put our will under subjection of the Holy Spirit. Will we live by God's laws blamelessly like John the Baptist's parents? Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. 
Verse 8, Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I've told the men not to touch you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get you a drink from the water jars the men have filled. There's a, there's a drinking from the outpouring of this Holy Spirit. The striking of the rock at Rephidim is a gushing of the water that comes. After Yeshua is struck, it's going to be open. And here Boaz, our kinsman redeemer, the type in the picture of Yeshua Messiah, is telling us, drink deeply from the water jars of the Holy Spirit and stay in the field of the living God, living on the fresh manna of His Word. Amen? This is important. Drink deeply from the water jars, getting the manna in God's field right here. Now, Exodus 18. <clears throat> Big movement in the churches of God to do away with leadership. Big movement to do away with leadership. You can't do away with leadership. How many midrash groups have to fail before we finally figure it out? I said midrash. I meant midrash. I have a joke, but I'm going to keep it to myself. Exodus 18, verse 24. <clears throat> Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided for themselves. And so in this way, God sets order among the people. There has to be order of the people. That's why there's elders and prophets and deaconesses and deacons and teachers. That's why we have classes for one thing and classes for another thing. That's why we have fellowship meals. That's why we have the order and the structure we have. It's here to give you the structure and the guidance on which to build this great life. And you have talented and capable people. Look, I... I <clears throat> Lord, I've been talking back and forth, and he keeps telling me you have a lot of talent lined up. Call out all the best speakers and get them trained up because we're going to go places and we're going to do things. you got people who actually want to travel, so get some travel sets. So maybe some of y'all that aren't in gear yet, I'm not, that's not being judgmental or harsh or, or even goading you any, but some of y'all may be thinking about it and wanting it. Let's get it all ready so we can do it. Amen? There's a lot of things we can do out of this little group. I, I don't think we understand how powerful this little group is. We're tiny. We're tiny. I get we're tiny. We're doing 1,800 of these magazines a quarter, guys. That's a lot. I got a call this week from a lady in Corinth, Mississippi, who saw this in the hospital and wants her own. This is getting the work done. I put this magazine up against anybody's. It's, it's, it's a good quality magazine. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell anybody they don't have a good magazine. I'm just telling you, I, I think ours is as good as anybody's. We got good product. We got good product to get the word out, and we're doing it. And you know, believe it or not, our little churches are not all that small in the Sabbath world. We're not that tiny in the Sabbath world. But we're a lot more active, and we do a lot more things, because we're a lot more motivated. See? Y'all have made that agape decision a lot of times. Huh? Come on. You've made that agape decision a lot of times, right? Doesn't it make you feel good? Yeah, come on. So order in the last days. Because everything God does is in order. When we respond favorably to the order that God demands of our lives, then he will begin to bless us. Ruth chapter 2, verse 14. I know the speakers are familiar with this verse because they rely on it. They rely on it. This is the power verse for the people that want to speak. Verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. Come on over here with us. She's off in the corner, hiding out. In the, come over here. Come over here. Sit in the shelter in the shade with the rest of us. Have some bread and dip it into wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvester, she offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Huh. Start getting under that tallit. Start getting in the word. The Lord starts giving you stuff. The Lord likes to give you stuff. The Lord really, really, really likes for you to be under that tallit so he can give you stuff. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them on the ground for her to pick up. 
So Ruth gleaned until evening that she threshed the barley she gathered and amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she gathered. And Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over from lunch. More than enough. She goes from gleaning little pieces to more than enough. More than enough. Yeshua wants to give you more than enough. Especially when you're speaking, because he's feeding everybody when he feeds you. How much better can that get, right? He wants to feed everybody, so you get into Talit, you in the way. Pour it on me. I mean, you don't like that? I mean, that's as good as it gets right there, man. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you know, what are you going to say? I mean, it's just... <laughs> <clears throat> Exodus 19. <clears throat> As we begin to conform to his desires, instead of asking him to conform to our desires, he's going to bless our socks off. And he's going to give us what we need to overcome. But we still have to clean up our own mess. He's not going to, he's not going to change your diapers for you. You've got to do that for yourself. <clears throat> Exodus 19, verse 10. Now look, this is good advice. This will start on Thursday, this coming week, right? Moses, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits around the mountain <clears throat> and tell them, Be careful that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. That's so that those people who are doing the shooting don't get unclean. We're not going to get unclean. We're going to kill you, but you, we're not going to get unclean doing it. Look at here now, at the, at the last part of the verse. Only when the ram's horn sounds the long blast may they go up to the mountain. See, they were supposed to go up. They were supposed to go up at the last blast. At the last blast, the long blast. That's the Takiya Hago de la. Hmm. So there's a preparation in the flesh to have an encounter in the spirit. I'll repeat that. There's a preparation in the flesh to have an encounter in the spirit. So starting Thursday, you've got to consecrate yourselves against Sunday so you can have that encounter in the Spirit, right? Now, Tekiah Haggadalah, I thought, was for trumpets. But there's three feasts on which it's blown. Pentecost, or Shavuot, trumpets, and atonement. Huh. Huh. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter. Hmm. In verse 37, Paul is talking about wheat. Wheat is harvested at Pentecost. You notice the wheat fields are ready, right? Because it's Pentecost. They're ready. It's Pentecost. So the wheat's ready. Yeah. Got no, the wheat's ready now. Pentecost next week, right? Exodus 19 is preparing the bride for the groom. Because you see, it is said, held by the rabbis, that ancient Israel married God in, ver in chapter 20. So chapter 19 is preparing the bride to marry the groom. And the rescue is the taking the bride to the wedding. The rescue is taking the bride to the wedding. Ruth, uh, ch chapter 3, verse 7. Ruth is the type of the church. Ruth is a type and a picture of the end time church. She was lost in Moab, and she had to make a commitment to return to God. Most everybody in the United States was lost, and we had to get saved. So we always talk about, are you saved? Are you saved? What we mean by that is, I was lost, and now I've been found by Yeshua. The problem is we don't take any steps after that. I, I'm just sitting here that's saved. I'm still sinning. I'm not moving. But see, that's the thing about hungry hearts. We believe that after you get saved, you've got to start moving and keeping the commandments. That's why we keep the commandments. That's why we're Torah observant. Now, uh, Ruth 3 and verse 7. I'm not going to read all of this. She, she is sent to the threshing floor, and she is told when Boaz falls asleep to go uncover his feet and lay at his feet, which is an offer of marriage. So, Boaz wakes up. Maybe you got a breeze or something on those feet. They get cold. You know, your feet get cold. You do wake up. He wakes up, and there's a woman at his feet, and he's kind of tripping out. Who are you? He's a righteous man. He doesn't want a woman down here at night. Right? He's a righteous man. He's, he, don't, he, don't want, he don't want any of this bad stuff that comes with this. And she says, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread the corner of your tallit. Spread the wing of your tallit over me. When she's saying by that, marry me. 
marry me. Now, there's a cost with Ruth. We, it's not, I'm not going to go through the story again. There's a cost with Ruth. Ruth comes with a property that has to be done. Boaz will have to raise up children for Elimelech before he can have any children with, with Ruth for himself. It's a cost. It's going to cost him a lot to marry Ruth. That's why the other kinsman redeemer said, I can't do it. I can't do it. There's a cost involved here. Hold on. This is, this is so important. Have you been gleaning precious manna from your Bible? Are you drinking deeply from the water jars of the Holy Spirit that Yeshua is filled? Then we've got to go to him and uncover his feet. He is our kinsman redeemer. We don't have Boaz. We have Yeshua. We've got to go to him and uncover his feet. We have to show him that we're serious. We have to show him that we want him as our kinsman redeemer and that we want him to marry us. You see, the wedding of ancient Israel was on Pentecost. Will the wedding of the church be on Pentecost? 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8. Paul speaking. He just wrote this great resurrection chapter. And he says here, I'm going to stay on at Ephesus till Pentecost because the great door has worked for me. Now he wants to winter in Corinth, but he's in Ephesus. And he's going to stay until Pentecost. Is it that is it he's writing his Pentecost message and so this is what's on his mind? I think so. If you flip back to chapter 15 and verse 22, I'm not, 12, I'm not going to read all this. There's a lot of people that say there's no resurrection of the dead. I guess that was in Paul's day too. He's refuting that. He's saying people say there's no resurrection of the dead. But Jesus Christ has definitely, definitively been resurrected from the dead. Therefore, there has to be. And if, Christ is, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ can't be resurrected either. And that makes us all be liars because we're telling you he's resurrected. But he was certainly resurrected. So... All of these people now don't want a resurrection of the dead. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then you're lost in your sins because Christ hasn't been resurrected either. But Christ has been resurrected, therefore there is a resurrection of the dead, and that's what's going to happen. Amen? Verse 23. But each in his own turn. Christ, then the first fruits. We talked about the first fruits last time I was here. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. We're those first fruits. Christ is the first of the first fruits, and we're the first fruits that follow. Amen? The Tekiahago de la of God was first blown on Pentecost. Ruth is the type of, if you go back and read it, in, in Exodus 20, he blows the shofar. I'm sorry, the end of uh, Exodus 19, he blows the shofar. The God blows the shofar. It was first blown then by him. Ruth is the type of the church. It's the story to be read on Pentecost. A people consecrating them to meet the Creator God on Pentecost. The feast of the wedding is on Pentecost. Verse 35. But someone may ask, how were the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed perhaps of wheat. There we go with the wheat again. Or something else. But God gives it a body as he's determined. And each kind of seed he gives his own body. All flesh is not the same. You got men, you got animals, you got birds, you got fish. All different kind of flesh. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind. And the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has a splendor. The moon has a splendor. The stars have splendor. But they're all different. And then he says stars differ from stars in splendor. All stars aren't alike. Some stars are bigger, some stars are brighter, some stars are colder, some stars are hotter. So it will be in the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So if there's a natural body and you're in it, there will be a spiritual body. So it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, or a nephesh. The last man, Adam, a life-giving ruach, or spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, that's us. And is the man from heaven, so also are those from heaven, that's us later. Just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we will bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Wow! Only when the ram's horn sounds were they supposed to go up onto the mountain. And the, the 74 elders of Israel, Moses and Aaron, Nahadab and Abihu, they all went up on the Sea of Glass. They had a covenant wedding supper with God Almighty, and they lived to talk about it. They came off the mountain, they lived to talk about it. They saw the God of Israel, and it said He didn't move on them, and they lived. 
Oh, come on. I don't get no better than that. It's the feast of Pentecost, the feast of the rescue. It's the feast of the birth of the church, the feast of the wedding, the feast of the law, the feast of the spirit. Verse 50. I tell you, brothers, <coughs> flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, that's the great trumpet, the Tegiahaga de la, <coughs> for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, the, the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Yeshua Messiah. Hallelujah. If you've been gleaning precious manna, from God's word, if you've been drinking deeply from the water jars of God's Holy Spirit, then it's time to uncover his feet, and it's time to ask him to cover you with his tallit. I want to thank you for watching today's message. I hope it encourages you to have a closer walk with Yeshua Messiah and a stronger love of your Bible, the written word of God. If you're interested in more information about Hungry Hearts Ministry, please go to HungryHeartsMinistryWithAY.com and uh, find out more about it. You can email me at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com for a free copy of Pursuit Magazine. It comes out quarterly, and I'll mail it to you without fail. I want to thank you for watching. We hope to see you again next week.